Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, three. City, city, sibilance, sibilance. Levels check, good, sounds good. One, two, three, rolling and... It's totally awesome if you want to help others. And I think film has the power to, to do that and connect people around a topic that's hard. But if your goal is to help others and your needs are put to the side, your mental health needs, your physical needs, your emotional needs, then I think making a personal film will actually do more harm than good because you can't circumvent your own needs because you think you owe something to others. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life. This is a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 132, and it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of documentary film and the Documentary Life podcast. A few years ago, I received an email that took me aback. It really made me think of the responsibility that I have as the host of this show and as someone who gives doc filmmaking advice on the podcast, in consultations, on the TDL Community Facebook group, and in our weekly Doc Life or Elite Mastermind. The more that I was putting myself out there, the more people were turning to me for advice on things like preparing for documentary interviews, shooting in adverse environments, fair use in documentary, etc., etc., but this particular email was about something very different from the typical asks for advice. It was very personal in a way that I hadn't come across before. And it was something that I felt I wasn't exactly equipped to give advice on. It was about childhood trauma. Specifically, it was about sex abuse. And how this person had spent a lot of time over the past year considering making a personal documentary about his experiences with it how our show was inspiring him to take a step forward out of the darkness and into a scary but potentially cathartic release. I took a couple of days with the email and I spoke to some colleagues and I wrote this person back with as much empathy and compassion I could possibly give another human being who had gone through something I personally had never gone through myself. I encourage them to continue to use professional help, and I encourage them to move forward with their documentary film if they truly felt like it was the right and true thing for them to do. Today, I still don't know if I gave them the right answer, whatever right is. I still think about it from time to time. I still think of that person that emailed me a few years ago. And if he is still listening to the show, well, this episode is for you, my friend. And I know that a number of you are making personal documentaries, whether about childhood trauma or not. This show is also dedicated to you. It is dedicated to the survivors. It is dedicated to those of you brave enough to embark on a very personal journey in hopes of helping others who have gone through what you have gone through. And maybe more importantly, helping yourself heal the wounds of the past. Our guest conversation with doc filmmaker Sasha Joseph Newlinger is going to speak more directly with the personal doc that deals with personal trauma. But before we do get to that, I thought that I might offer up some general tips for making the personal documentary. Oftentimes, as documentary filmmakers, we will choose topics that are near and dear to our hearts. We have quite personal connections to these topics. So it's only natural we choose to be a central part of our films and make what is known as the personal documentary. While some of the more powerful stories in documentary can be of a very personal nature, 
There are things that any documentary filmmaker must consider before embarking on the personal documentary journey. And here are some tips for that journey. The first one is have a way to film yourself. Now, this is kind of an obvious and a very practical tip. You have to have a way to film yourself or at the very least have someone filming you. But really, even if you have someone filming you, you're still going to need a way to film yourself because the notion that someone is going to be with you filming 24-7 is a pretty fantastic and I might add pretty frightening thought. Because you're doing a personal documentary, you're often going to want to have the ability to share some immediate thoughts to camera or film yourself or something that has happened on the fly. Because of this, you must have easy and quick access to a camera at all times. Now, these days, that's pretty easy since most of us have mobile phones with some pretty great video capabilities. That being said, just be sure that's the look that you're going to want for these spontaneous or journal-esque type moments. You should think through prior to beginning production on the look and feel on what camera or cameras will be employed and the reasons for employing them. You may decide to shoot truly personal moments with your phone. And if you're an athlete, perhaps your moments where you're practicing your sport with an action camera like a GoPro. And perhaps you want footage that isn't directly on you to be shot in an obviously different style and look. You'll want to figure this all out beforehand if possible and then move forward with whatever you decide. However that looks, just make sure that you always have quick access to some type of video recording device. Number two, decide how personal you're willing to be. Since you're making a documentary that is going to be about you and possibly your life, it's probably pretty important to decide early on how personal you want to be. How much of your life are you willing to expose to the outside world? Remember, once you make this film and get it out into the world, nowadays it's practically impossible to pull back from it. So you need to be honest with yourself about what you're willing to share with the world, with your family, your friends, your kids, your grandkids. When you make your film, it's pretty forever, and that should not be taken lightly. Now as a side note here, remember that any of your family and friends who might end up in your film will also have to live with the image that is presented of them. They too will be affected by how they are portrayed. Now you might remember when we had on documentary filmmakers Leo Warshawski and Todd Soliday, and there was one particularly sensitive and emotional moment when they are interviewing Leah's father, Maury. And they had to make a very conscious choice on whether or not to include some very raw and emotional moments. And they, as well as Maury, will have to live with that choice now for the rest of their lives. You might also remember we had on IDA Career Achievement Award winner Lourdes Portillo on the podcast, a woman who's well acquainted with the personal documentary. And she even said on the episode how some of her family have not spoken with her since she did her films 30 years ago. This, of course, is not to scare you. Actually, maybe in a way it is. But the point is just to be very conscious of how you might be willing to present yourself on camera as well as others who may be in your film, that there can be consequences depending on how you might portray yourself and or others. Number three, choose a topic you're passionate about. If you're doing a personal documentary, you are hopefully passionate about what you are doing and the things that you're saying in your documentary. If not, you could end up making a pretty boring video diary of events of your life. And trust me, no one really wants to see that. Maybe I shouldn't speak for others, but I don't want to see that. I don't want to invest a couple hours of my time to watch you going to the grocery store, cutting your fingernails, or having boring conversations with your boring friends. Well, actually, that's not entirely true, I suppose. I thoroughly enjoyed seeing that in the Males' Brothers' Grey Gardens. <laughs> But seriously, your personal documentary will most likely contain some sort of interesting story element anyway, otherwise you might not have a need to make the film in the first place. You might be someone who's actively engaged in helping refugees acclimate to your town. Or you might have discovered a new and unique way to sail around the world on a boat made of balsa wood. You might be a teacher at a particularly diverse school on the border with Mexico. You get what I'm saying here. There has to be something that you deeply care about, not just because the viewer needs a good reason to invest their time watching your film, but also because you yourself are going to be investing an extraordinary amount of time making your film. You'll want to have something to say, whether it be during pieces directly to camera 
or through the filming of events taking place or, or whatever. You can have something to say literally or with the footage that you're shooting. Number four, can you be comfortable in front of the camera? This may seem rather obvious initially, but it's actually something you really do need to consider. Can you not only be comfortable in front of the camera, but do you think that others will want to see you on camera? And I don't mean this in any vain sort of sense. I don't mean are you attractive or super witty or anything like that. I just mean when the camera is on, which it will be a lot of the time, are you able to speak and act in a way that's pretty natural? Or are you, in fact, intimidated by the camera and are unable to speak what's on your mind? Or are you often too aware of the camera or are very self-conscious? Now, it may also be that you just need some time with the camera. Most subjects of documentaries, I would wager, have a bit of time that's necessary for them to get used to a camera being around, let alone a crew of some size. That's perfectly natural and understandable. But after a while, the camera kind of seems to fade from the scene. You do get used to it. But if you're never really able to get used to it, or you're always apprehensive or shy about it, well then you might want to reconsider having a film about yourself or your life made. Because it's just going to make you anxious all of the time. And if you're anxious at all, that's most certainly going to be seen on camera. So do find out what your comfort level is or could be with this. Lastly, number five, don't over explain. One very quick way to either bore or turn off an audience member from watching your film is if you constantly over explain things. Never beat people over the heads with your ideas or thoughts or suggestions. Let people come to their own conclusions. After all, isn't that part of why we read a story or watch a film to be able to take the information and then form our own opinions about it? Now, Obviously, if you're making a Michael Moore type doc, you're perhaps trying to shape people's minds about a particular subject. And he can certainly go over the top with his presentation, although he often does this sort of thing with a wink of an eye to the audience. But unless you're making this kind of a documentary, you'll want to remind yourself that you want to allow your audience the opportunity to take in what you're presenting to them and to form their own opinions. Best way that you can do this is to show, don't tell. So allow us to see events and people without your actual voice or narration always telling us what we're seeing or how we should interpret what we're seeing. You may need to go through and rewrite your narration if you are using narration in your film. You might have to rework it a few times so as to make sure you're not over-explaining moments. I hope that some of these tips will help those of you looking to embark upon your own personal documentary journey. Feel free to share some of your own thoughts and tips in the Documentary Life Community Facebook page. All right, now after a quick break, we'll get right to our conversation with Sasha Joseph Newlinger. And that's all coming up next here on The Documentary Life. Hey Doc Lifer, I'd like to ask a quick favor. It'll take you no more than a few minutes, I promise. And it's super simple too. I'm asking you to give a rating and review of the podcast by going to iTunes, hopefully giving us five stars, and writing a sentence on what you like about the show. This helps us with the iTunes algorithm and gets the podcast out to more people like yourself who can benefit from it. If you feel that you indeed have gotten something from the show, we'd love you to pay it forward to new listeners. And of course, it helps us too. And if you do this in the month of June, we'll even sweeten the pot a little. Simply take a screenshot of your rating and review and email it to me at chris at barongfilms.com. That's chris at b-a-r-a-n-g films.com. And you'll be automatically entered into a draw for a free 30-minute doc film consultation with yours truly. And there are two of these free one-on-one consultations that I'll be giving away. So make sure that you get your rate and review in by the end of June for a chance to win. And in advance, thank you for your support. (laughs) 
Sasha Joseph Newlinger is the co-founder and head of production at Step One Films. After finishing film school at Montana State University, he discovered the raw materials that would propel him to tell the story of his life. An autobiographical film, Years in the Making, Rewind, premiered at the 2019 Tribeca Film Festival, where it received a special jury mention. The film was Sasha's feature-length directorial debut. First of all, Sasha, welcome to the program. It's very excited to have you joining us today in the documentary life. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be a part of this podcast and to have a conversation with you. And I see that you're, you're sporting your, your Tribeca Film Festival t-shirt. I'm glad that you wore that. You know, what's funny is uh, I my wife wakes up much earlier than me. She works in tech and has to get rolling. And uh, I came downstairs and she was wearing her Tribeca shirt. So we're matching. Today. <laughs> so it's a Tribeca day. <laughs> it is great. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. So, so Sasha, I, of course, after watching your film, and I just watched it recently, um, your father, I know, worked in video production. He has that background. And of course, his video production and, and, and really videotapes uh, play a, an immense part in your discovery and in your doc film. Can you tell us briefly, so how did documentary film happen for you? I, I grew up with with storytelling, filmic storytelling around me. My dad, um, I think purposely left a lot of his gear around the house, film yeah. gear. Um, and so I was immediately interested. Um, and so, you know, and not to mention that I was his primary subject. You know, he, he took 200 hours of home videos. So I was always in front of the camera and when it wasn't rolling, I was very interested in the mechanics and how it worked. And, you know, back in the early nineties, uh, the cameras were so big that as a little child, I couldn't hold them. So, <laughs> you know, he would hold the camera up for me and I could look through the peephole and see yeah. what was going on. Um, but you know, it's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, film has basically been part of my life since day one. It yeah. actually, it has been. So, yes, it um, has, right. And, and watching my dad, you know, work, um, you know, I would go to his office sometimes and I'd see him in his editing bay and I would see how he was putting different images and different clips together. And when he would show me final products, um, I just, I felt like it was magic. So I've always been into film. Um, yeah. and I was into acting, um, earlier in life because that was just kind of a, um, you know, a continuation of being in front of the camera. But as I yeah. got older, uh, high school age, and then into college, um, it was clear to me that I really wanted to be behind the camera. Yeah. So tell us, a, you know, briefly what Rewind is all about. What What is the what is Rewind about? Let's give some context for listeners who have not seen the film. And then initially, why was this an important project for you, for you to do? And it's your first feature documentary. Yeah. Um, you know, I... So yeah, Rewind is an autobiographical documentary about my journey to confront the multi-generational child sexual abuse in my family. Um, so I myself was a victim of abuse um, and uh, there were other victims that came a generation before me. And the journey really is that of reconciling the past, being able to look at the past from a new lens, an adult lens, years removed from the trauma, yeah. and juxtapose that with the experience, the subjective experience I remembered as a kid. Yeah. And the purpose of doing this is to ask questions and understand the greater context of my own personal narrative. What happened? How did this happen? Why did it happen? Why did it take so long to get justice? Um, yeah. And so, you know, it didn't start out as a plan to be a documentary. So I was finishing up school at Montana state university and right. there were a lot of things that were going really well. Um, I got a job with this group called Grizzly Creek films, um, in Bozeman and right out of the gate, I was working on a national geographic television show and yeah. it felt really good, but there was still this voice in the back of my mind, this self deprecating voice, um, <laughs> that said, you don't deserve this. Or if people knew, you know, your truth, what happened, they wouldn't want to be near you. Uh -huh. And, and that voice had a lot more power when I was a kid, less power as an adult, but nevertheless, it was still there. And so yeah. I figured that there might be some answers uh, to where that voice was coming from yeah. in the home videos. I wanted to find out where that voice was coming from so that I might be able to 
put it to sleep. Um, And after watching the first six tapes uh, of 200 hours of footage, I realized that I needed to watch all of this footage. And furthermore, for every question that was being answered in the home video, I had 10 new questions, questions I wanted to ask human beings, my mom, my dad, the detective, the prosecutor, my psychiatrist. And that's when I realized that this really was going to be a a long drawn out journey um, and potentially a very cathartic one. And it lent itself to documentary and Mm. documenting this experience, because if it was that powerful of an experience for me and my family in capturing it and sharing it um, for the purposes of education, but also um, uh, inviting closeness with an audience, that's, that's doc, right? So, um, yeah, I was 23 years old. I had just finished school and, um, I was, you know, I had maybe like, you know, a grand in my bank account and I just flew to Philadelphia <laughs> and one of my college buddies, Jeff Doherty, he's, uh, he's our cinematographer. Uh, one of our cinematographers, he flew out and we started filming and seven years later, here we are. You know how you have a nightmare and you wish you could go back? I know vaguely how I got to this place, but there are pieces that are missing. Can you tell us who we have here? Who is that? Sasha was an extraordinary child. He was very interactive. He was very present. He started asking for the camera more often. I'm sorry I did something bad, okay? Why do you have all of this footage. They're happy moments. Every time I videotaped you guys, it was all that. Now, when I look at them, I see that in the background, stuff was going on. Sasha would seem withdrawn. His behavior became scary. Turn off the thing! He was completely unpredictable. Quiet! Why did we come to this tree? You were expressing that something was awful and you didn't want to continue living. Sasha was frightened to death. If you tell, I'll kill you. That was the first time you disclosed that any abuse had occurred. This is the drawing. That started the whole show. Ah! When you have two attorneys that have an unlimited supply of funds, they can file a lot of motions. That was really the first window into the kind of power that this individual held. Did you do what he said you did? Speak to my lawyer. It was going to be an all-out war against you. To lock up somebody like that, you have to start getting all your ducks in a row. Sasha's first reaction was, we're going to go to trial. It's all or nothing. They tried every which way to confuse you. This child has put different faces and different names on these kinds of allegations. This case really wasn't about sex. It was about power. This whole revisiting all of this has kind of displaced me. Why didn't you come to me and tell me? It's a puzzle made from my life, and I have to put that puzzle back together if I'm ever going to really move on. Incredible courage from that little boy. Don't give up on me yet. Now, Sasha, you mentioned your mom and dad, and obviously family members are key to the uh, the telling of the story. Um, certainly uh, your father is and your mom is. Uh, what I'd like to know is, how was it? How did you get them on board with this project? And were there family members that maybe it affected your relationship with, with them adversely? So first of all, how did mom and dad come onto the project? And then how did other family members react? Yeah, you know, um, my dad was the first person I called um, yeah. because he had the tapes. And, and I didn't know how many tapes he had. So when I wanted to start finding answers as to where is this voice coming from? How can I heal these, these old wounds? I called him first because I, I figured he had some tapes. But to my surprise, he had three huge boxes of five different formats, you know, 200 hours of home video. Oh, um, so you actually didn't realize that he had that sheer amount. I had no idea. Oh, yeah, I had, wow. I had no idea. I thought yeah. maybe I'd get like 10 tapes, you know? Because, yeah. you know, he filmed a bunch, but it's home video, stuff gets recorded over, it's, it's right. a long That's time right. ago. Right. Yeah. And a lot of the tapes, like, were never labeled. So when I got the boxes, you know, it's like 
some of them had labels and some of them were completely blank. It's a crapshoot. What are you going to see today? You know? Yeah. Um, but he was at first, you know, I told him what I was trying to do and I, I didn't know that it was going to be a film yet, but um, he said, well, you know, are you sure you want to get these tapes? Like your abusers are in the tapes. Like mm. there could be some triggering stuff in there. And I was like, no, nah, that's exactly what I want. I want yeah. the raw material. Yeah. So he sent the tapes. And then once I knew it was a doc, uh, that, that I wanted this to be a doc, um, you know, right off the bat, he was just so supportive, you know, mm. being a filmmaker and knowing, uh, the power of, of that, that a filmmaker has with those raw materials in terms of how they convey a story. Yeah. There's a lot of vulnerability there and right. Especially for my dad as, as viewers will see in the film right. and for him to not only say, yes, do this, I support you and let me know how I can, be of, of greater support as yeah. you embark on this. That was really huge. And also he didn't need to in, insert um, or project his filmic identity onto it. Yeah. He allowed it to be mine, which was really cool. Yeah. Um, and so once that conversation happened, I called my mom. She was incredibly supportive, choked up, very proud. Yeah. But the person who, uh, initially showed some resistance was my sister, my little sister, uh, Becca. Right. And what she said, she was like, why do you want to, why do you want to dig this all up? Like we just yeah. got over all of this. Yeah. And what I said to her was, Becca, we, we may have survived this, mm. but we didn't get over it. I said, if, if there's something from our past that we can't touch without being triggered and brought into severe pain, we haven't moved on from it. We haven't gotten over it. It's something we're trying to avoid. And for yeah. me, survival isn't enough. For me, getting through something isn't enough. I want to clean out these wounds and truly heal them so that we can all move forward with our lives. And after we had a successful Kickstarter campaign in yeah. 2014, she saw messages from survivors around the globe. Oh. Um, that's when she realized, okay, maybe it's my own shame and my stigma that's making me scared of this. And I don't need to hold that anymore. Oh, man. And really, you know, um, the fact that they all rallied around me eventually, and that they all chose to, uh, join me in this very raw, cathartic, vulnerable journey mm. if any one of those three chose not to we wouldn't have the film that we're talking about today right right right, right. so so sasha let's speak directly to you know the first or second time doc filmmaker who wants to make a very personal doc of this nature whether they're you know they're discussing maybe uh domestic abuse childhood abuse sexual abuse uh alcoholism um you know, it runs the gamut, right? And so I have personally received over the years a handful of emails from doc filmmakers saying, you know, Chris, I want to tell this story. It's a very personal story. I don't even know if I'm the right person to tell it or if I'm capable of it, but I know that it's something that I really want to do because I want to be able to share the story in an effort to to help other people, um, to, to, to help myself and provide some catharsis, as, as you alluded to or, or mentioned there. What would you say to that doc filmmaker who wants to set out on this type of journey and maybe is really hesitant to do so, feeling that they're not the person to tell it or that they're not equipped to do this? So, yeah, that's thank you for giving me the opportunity to answer that question. Um, I there, There's two big nuggets of advice that I just want to share right off the bat, and then I could get a little bit more personal in my, in my answer. Um, I don't think that it's advisable to embark on a journey like this, unless you have the support of a clinically trained mental health professional mm -hmm. um, and uh, a trusted uh, film team that, that can bring with them uh, gentle but firm objectivity. You know, it's very important when you're telling a personal story um, to have space and room, creative space and room to. Um, bring the very raw subjective uh, experience in mm. to the film that you're making. Um, but you also want to have a trusted network that you can collaborate with that can bring complete 
filmic objectivity to the project. And as you're filming, as you're cutting the film, um, I think it really helps toe that line between um, gripping and intense, vulnerable truth and uh, structural clarity and audience awareness. So, you know, it took me seven years to make Rewind um, and it, it totally kicked my ass. I mean, it totally kicked my ass. Um, but I can honestly say that it was worth it. For me, it was worth it because today I have such a, such a healthy perspective on my own narrative. There was catharsis. I have healthier, happier relationships with my family. And most importantly, I have an extremely healthy, happy, um, functional relationship with myself, which is enabling me to live what I consider to be my best life. Um, and what I would say is this personal journey, um, like if I had done all of this work, personal work without cameras, it still would have been just as effective, I think, for my family and I. Mm. So you really have to ask yourself as a filmmaker, like, why do I want this to be a film? What do I want to get out of it? And I've talked to other filmmakers and a lot of them who have personal stories say, yeah. you know, I, I want to help others, which is totally awesome. That was a part of what I wanted to do, but there's a caveat there in my opinion is that it's, it's totally awesome if you want to help others. And I think film has the power to, to do that and connect people around a topic that's hard. But if your goal is to help others and your needs are put to the side, your mental mm. health needs, your physical needs, your emotional needs, um, then I think making a personal film will actually do more harm than good because um you can't circumvent your own needs uh, because you think you owe something to others. Um, so that's, that's, that's my response in a nutshell. Um, and also and for any doc filmmaker, as we all know, like one of the biggest issues is raising funds to make a film. I was and, literally uh, going to start talking about that. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh my God. Dude. Like honestly, more than the emotional journey of making this film, what, kicked my ass the most was fundraising yeah. like I, you know and if if you want to ask a specific question of fundraising but i'm happy to talk about that yeah. part of it yeah well let's i mean let's literally talk a bit about the journey of that so what were your first means of raising <laughs> funds how did you approach that obviously you, you mentioned the kickstarter um but but if one watches of course the credits as i often do with doc films um there's a number of other sources that come into play. So give us a little bit of what the journey is. So start early on, right, yeah. with the trickling in of money, and then how that progressed for you. Oh, man. You know, and I think I was also, I was young enough. I was 23 when I started this. I'm yeah. 30 now. I was, 20, I was young enough. I was just young enough and naive enough to really believe that I could do it. Oh, um, yeah. If I, like, went, if like, if I tried to do it, like, I now know how freaking hard it is to raise money for a doc. It's, it's wow. a, it's total pain, but, um, but, but yeah. So when I first flew to Philadelphia, yeah. um, after watching the first six tapes, um, the goal was to get just a couple interviews that were geared towards, um, a pitch video. Yeah. Like that right. was my first thing. It's like, okay, no, I know I want to make a film. I need to make a pitch video. So, um, you know, I interviewed, uh, the detective, uh, detective Warren, I interviewed the prosecutor. Um, I interviewed Abby Newman at mission kids, which is the child advocacy center. It was created as a result of what I went yeah, through. Yeah. And actually at some point I'm going to post that video. Cause I, I look, we all look the whole team. We all look so young. Oh, <laughs> and man. So, oh, so, man. you know, Seven bright -eyed years and later. Pale, you know, <laughs> like we're going to do this. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we made that pitch video and, um, you know, we didn't have an office, you know, we're sitting at like cafes with our laptops, like figuring out who we're going to send this to, how are we going to get it out there? And I think we raised like, you know, 3,600 bucks from yeah. sending it to just family and, and friends and people who we knew. Yeah. And then, um, 
And then I ended up showing the film to Thomas Winston, who ended up being an executive producer and producer of the film, um, who I worked for at Grizzly Creek Films. Oh, Rewind right. a little bit. There like are, I, yeah. I was working with him and before he saw the pitch video, like with the whole Philadelphia thing, like I, when I knew this was going to be a film, yeah. like went in and I was like, Hey Tom, um, like I have to give you like my two weeks. Cause I have to go, <laughs> direct a film about child abuse. But I wasn't like, I didn't tell him like, this is autobiographical or yeah. else. And so he was like, okay, like, good luck. You know, like, I, I don't know why you're leaving. Like, I thought you liked it here, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like six months later, he saw the pitch video, um, oh. which incorporated home video and everything yeah. else. And he's like, hey, do you want support from our team, which happens to be like an Emmy award winning National Geographic film team. And I was like, yes, please. Thank you. Oh, man. Um, so with his help, uh, we kind of, you know, he invested some, some initial funds into this, some exploratory funds to look at more home video. So he set me up with an office. I was able to watch all the home video. Wow. And then from there, we did our first like in-person fundraiser in Philadelphia. Okay. Um, with, a, with an old family friend, uh, Hope Cohen, who's in Philadelphia. And we raised $20,000 there. And we used those funds, because $20,000 isn't gonna get you much in, in the way of making a film, but it's a great um, social slash PR slash fundraising account. Yeah. So we used those funds to make more money. We basically used those funds um, to create the Kickstarter campaign and do it what we felt was right. Tom invested enough money for us to do um, a full one week shoot with two cameras. Mm -hmm. um, and we used footage from that shoot um, uh, to create our Kickstarter video um, and the 20,000 from Philly to create our Kickstarter campaign. Wow. From the Kickstarter campaign, we raised $176,000, um, which was awesome. And again, I was like, oh, great, like we're funded. And uh, Tom was like, well, let's just like see how, how this goes. Like he's a veteran, you know? And uh, we were able to shoot um, two camera, two, sometimes three cameras, excellent on-site sound, um, yeah. three week shoot in Philadelphia. So we finished principal photography. Um, wow. What, what a way to be able to do that. That's so rare to be able to line up. Okay. Three weeks we're doing the shoot <laughs> not for oh, documentaries, man. man. No, man. I know. And that is the thing. That was the conversation we had. Like Tom was like, you know, we could be more conservative and yeah. not shoot everything we think we need and yeah. try to save enough money for post. He's like, but, and it was really his opinion. And I, and I followed him on it. He was yeah. like, He's like, I really think that we should just shoot this in the best way that we can. Let's get the content captured in the best way that we can and worry about fundraising later. Mm -hmm. And I'll say that, um, you know, we were able to get all the way up to basically organizing all of our footage, mm -hmm. you know, assembly edits for home video by decade, by year, you know, all this stuff, oh. but, and getting things synced with audio, but then our money was gone again. So we're back to trying to raise funds and, um, that's where things kind of stalled. So I would say like from 2013 to 2015, things were just rolling. Yeah. Um, we have, now we have everything shot, yeah. um, and we have it organized and synced and we have no money again. And there's posts and there's like, you know, 700 hours of footage. So <laughs> it's like, it's organized, but it's a huge task. Um, and so we embarked on more fundraising and yeah. eventually we did another in-person fundraiser in Bozeman, Montana, hmm. uh, raised like $60,000 there. Wow. And I'll say that that momentum got us a donation from Jewish community watch, got us, uh, some funds from some other organizations. And then we picked an editor that we thought was going to be great. And $60,000 later, we were like, this editor isn't, cutting it for us yeah, <laughs> so we're like oh no every pun um, intended <laughs> oh yeah right 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 seriously uh so that was heartbreaking um oh. and so that's when uh avila came on board our editor of the film um and she absolutely did an incredible job mm. um 
but you know, uh, once we were able to get a rough cut and again, Avila worked at Grizzly Creek films. She was part of Tom's oh. team, um, and Tom's investment in the film. Once we were able to get a rough cut, we started shopping it around. And, uh, that's when Cindy Meal, one of our executive producers saw the rough cut. And what she said to us was, I'll watch films that are sent to me from trusted colleagues, which this one was, yeah. um, but usually I watch 10 minutes and, and I'm done. She said, I watched it twice in the same day and wow. this film needs to be finished correctly. And, uh, and I want that to, I want to, I want to make that happen. Wow. And, uh, we had a conversation on the phone. We never met in person until after the agreement happened. Um, but she signed off for everything we needed to finish the film. Skywalker sound, yeah. um, an original score color correction at, at final frame, um, you know, <laughs> workshops, private workshops with other doc filmmakers in New York with the venues covered by Cindy. Like she brought a ton of experience and the finishing funds and, uh, and we were able to do it, but it was, I mean, it was a saga. Like I remember like getting on subways and like in the middle of summer in New York and like hustling to different like wealthy people's estates to like pitch to them covered in sweat and for yeah. them to like be like oh yeah i'm gonna give you money because you know i know plenty of rich people have told you they will and then they don't but i'm not one of them and then like they would ghost me you know for every or give you 50 bucks yeah, yeah right? <laughs> like, I, I once spent i once spent like uh, a week with with the group and uh like there was like this promise of funds and like they ended up writing a very small check and it was oh, just like dude painful. what like what I'm trying to make a movie here. And you know, you know? I just spent a week trying to yeah. <laughs> We're trying to make a movie, but it's but it's a hustle, you know? And yeah. and um and that's part of the game. You you gotta like, especially when it's such a personal story, like it's it it burns that much more when you get rejected, but mm. it also means that much more when someone believes in you and Somebody they write you a big you. check. Yeah. Yeah. So what are what are you guys doing now, Sasha? Of course, I know it's been been having obviously a PBS run. What are you guys doing now to ensure that it gets get its a large audience? Which I I, I understand it already is, but yeah. what has that process been been like? Yeah, you know, I want to I want to just say that um so PBS Independent Lens uh yeah. this was a big deal for us. We had a few offers on the table and some offers were bigger in terms of like the money being offered. Yeah. But at the end of the day, PBS was the home for this film. Independent mm -hmm. lens was the home for this film. And we yeah. all knew it. It was the only option where we would have the widest distribution and yeah. have it be commercial free. And for, I, I think, I think that is the most important piece. Like no amount of money um, can repay the seven years of hustle without income, right? Uh, you know, it's not, it, it's about, it's about viewership, I think. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. And not to undersell what they did for us, they were awesome. Um, yeah. But we chose PBS because they, you know, Independent Lens, because they just absolutely believed in our film and, um, and wanted it to be commercial free and widely accessible. So Rewind is, still streaming for free on PBS through yeah. June 10th. Okay. Um, but it's also for at least the next 15 years will be available on iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, Microsoft yeah. movies. Um, we're still looking for international distribution, mm -hmm. um, but the press that we've received so far, um, I think we have like 37 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes and we're still at 100%. So uh, I'm very pleased with that. Uh, hopefully that leads to hopefully that leads to uh, international distribution. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. So, so Sasha, as we wrap up here, speak directly to that first time again, that first time doc filmmaker who is making such a personal film, and and tell and and tell us something that we've missed in this conversation that you think you know what, Chris, that that doc filmmaker needs to know this about the journey they're about to embark upon. This journey, if you decide to make a film about a personal, a very personal story, I think it's so critical that you record yourself at the very beginning 
talking to yourself about why you want to do this. For me, um, before I started this journey, I recorded myself and I said, Sasha, you're going to be entering this long, long tunnel and you don't know how long it is or when you're going to get through to the end of the tunnel. But you have to remember that you're making the choice to enter. This isn't something that's being thrust on you or that's happening to you. It's through it's through your owned owned choice, right? Yeah. You own that. And it's important to remember that because along the journey, there are going to be moments that are so deflating and demoralizing and ass kicking one, because you're triggered by stuff Two, because there's huge ruts in the road Mm -hmm. and that leads to fatigue. But if you remember that this, this emotional filmic, Tour de France, whatever, is your choice that you chose it, that may be able to help you stick with it through to the finish line. If you believe in something that much, um, I, I, you know, my great grandfather said to me, and he's in the film, Joseph, he said, Sasha, don't think you can, no, you can. Yeah. And it's really important that while you have these ambitions, that you don't um, set a specific timeline for yourself because throughout the entire process, the most important thing you can do is, is focus on self care. If you put your self care second fiddle to the film then the film becomes more important than you. And thus the film becomes something that will take from you instead of give to you. So um, the film is supposed to be something that is, that is helping you. And um, if you're ever feeling tired, exhausted, emotionally triggered, you've got to take pauses. You've got to step back, talk with a mental health professional, reset yourself. Because ultimately this film that you're embarking on can only be as good as the work you're able to put into it. And if you're not at your best, how can your work be at your best? Sasha, I, I know that you mentioned early on that you didn't necessarily set out to make this film for other people, to impact other people. Um, But I I have to say that uh, I think your film is going to do just that. It really is. It's, 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 It's an incredible film. It's a very vulnerable film, and it's going to resonate and speak with an awful lot of people. And I think this conversation is gonna resonate with a lot of people, a lot of doc filmmakers. Thank you so much, Sasha, for for joining us today on the Documentary Life Podcast. Hey, thank you so much for having me. And um, thank you, everyone out there. Best of luck to all you doc filmmakers. We're uh, we're a special group of people working our butts off without the glamour of Hollywood, but but with a burning passion for storytelling. So high fives all around, everybody. (laughs) Thank you, Sasha. Now, don't forget, if you enjoy the podcast and you'd like the opportunity to win a free 30-minute doc film consultation with me, head on over to iTunes and write us a rate and review. Email me a screenshot of the rate and review to my email, chris at barongfilms.com. Again, that's chris at b-a-r-a-n-g films.com. Thanks again. We'll see you next episode. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.